My name is Andrew Baker. My friends call me AB, but never Andy. There's always some obnoxious drunk, some jerk who doesn't know me and wants to be more familiar than he deserves, and he'll always call me Andy. So Andy, what do you do for a living? I tell him. I created a neat little device that police officers can just point at you from 40 feet away and determine if you're drunk. They've started attaching them to radar guns all over the city. That usually stops them. Although, in case you haven't already guessed, no such device actually exists. I guess you can tell I don't tolerate fools very well. Fool me and it gets worse. I'm not a complicated person. In fact, I love the simple life. I like my job. I am an engineer at a large national company with many branches all over the country. I have friends. I don't drink much, but I can have a beer once in a while. Truth be told, I prefer nachos, but that's my struggle. If I get out of control, I'll gain weight. I need to keep this beast in check so I struggle and stay in reasonable shape for someone my age. I used to sail every chance I got, but a wife and two young daughters take up a lot of a person's time, and I soon sold the boat. This is just one of life's little sacrifices I made many years ago, and I did it gladly so that I could have time to spend with those I care about. I have been happily married to Karen, a high school teacher, for 25 years. Our two girls are in college. Claire attends Brown in Rhode Island, and her younger sister Denise attends Boston University. I doubt I could afford those schools, but the girls are serious students and have received some exceptional scholarships. We live in North Carolina, in a neighborhood called the Research Triangle. It's built around some very good universities in the Raleigh area, and the best high-tech firms are all around. It's a great place to live and work. I would tell you about the Carolina Barbecue Restaurant, but I just get hungry just thinking about it. I was a little disappointed when the girls decided to go north for college, but I think they needed to spread their wings a little bit, and in the long run, that's a good thing. The girls are great. They are smart, funny, outgoing girls with a strong sense of right and wrong. I worry every day about their safety, but I don't worry about their choices. Seeing them grow up and take their first steps toward independence meant that my wife and I would finally have time to ourselves again. I've been looking forward to these days for a long time. When both girls left for college, I dreamed of coming home every night to a loving wife who would give me her attention and I hers, and life would go on one joyous day after another. We could be like newlyweds again. We would go out to dinner, see plays, go to the movies, and finally be reunited the way I always wanted to be. But it didn't quite work out that way. Truth be told, in the first year of our empty nest, Karen began to change. Her interests were drifting away from me, or so it seemed. It happened gradually, but over time it became noticeable. I wrote it off as her having a chance to blossom when the girls separated, but over time I realized that I was observing a fundamental change in her values and priorities. Karen teaches English with an emphasis on creative writing. To be honest, and I hope rightly so, she is a frustrated writer. As a young mother and teacher, she never had time to write the way she wanted to. Karen wrote all summer and whenever she could spare an hour or two, but nothing much came out of it. She regularly submitted essays and short stories to literary magazines, accumulating only a vast collection of rejection letters, and the major work never came. To be honest, I love reading what my wife writes. But as a writer, she has never gotten beyond formulaic and often melodramatic stories. She has a romantic notion of what a writer should be, and I suspect, not that I've ever told her this, that she's more attracted to the idea of being a writer than to writing itself. No matter. If she's happy, I'm happy. For most of our marriage, Karen has been a member of a writer's group of one sort or another. These are people who get together to help each other, criticize, suggest, and discuss their work to make each other better. Some of the groups seemed really productive to me, while others seemed more like mutual admiration societies. Her last group, which was her current group when things fell apart, had both. They took turns getting together at each other's houses, and when they were here, I tried not to draw attention to myself. I tried to participate once, but it drew disapproving looks from Karen and some of the others, and I gave up trying. Karen's current writing group has about 10 people in it, and there are both men and women among them. Some of them I like. Others I'd go my whole life without. Half of them are unassuming, and half of them make a very definite impression when you meet them. Reggie, a woman, really enjoys writing stories and biographies. She does real research and writes books that have a strong academic focus, but still try to keep the reader engrossed. I've read them all and really enjoyed them. That's what I told her. 
Betty loves to write fantasy. I don't think she imagines herself to be the next J.K. Rowling. She's more like a talking unicorn, but she's pleasant and seems to write mostly for her own enjoyment. Who can deny that? Bill is a know-it-all. A little of that can drag on, but in all other respects he seems okay. And then there's Frank. The first time I met him, alarm bells went off in my head and they haven't stopped since. When I was introduced to Frank, and I was definitely given to understand that I was being introduced to him and not the other way around, he said, So Andy, what do you do? I looked at my wife, who pursed her lips and shook her head, and simply said, Engineer, Frank. What was that? A smile or a smirk? I've already told you that I've given up trying to participate in their band, but I try to be out of sight and out of mind, but not out of sound when they come in. I will work quietly in the next room or on the back porch with the window open until they forget I'm there. I've noticed from the beginning that when Frank interacts with Karen, it's like they have their own personal banter. Sometimes he inflates her ego, and other times he seems to know her thoughts with a kind of intimacy that doesn't bother me one bit. He refers to past conversations, and I get the impression that the rest of the group doesn't remember anything about them. It just seems that way to me, but I don't like it, and I've mentioned it to her. She just brushed off my concerns, and I know it's best not to push her. I made sure she knows how I feel about it. The rest is up to her. The group has its own pattern of meetings. After a work session, the group sits around a table, has some wine, and relaxes. That's when I find out that some of them are just faking it. It was the middle of the spring semester, early March, when the conversation turned to the lifestyle of real writers. Oh, all the great writers were alcoholics. Really? They write in the morning and drink in the afternoon and evening. It relaxes the brain for new ideas, and then in the mornings their creative juices flow and they write. Actually, all the really great writers had love affairs. That was their real inspiration. Frank said that. Thank you, Frank. I got your number, asshole. At that moment, Karen tied a knot in my stomach. Oh, I know. It's in the passion and excitement of the unknown. The thrill of hiding it all from other people's eyes that the real inspiration lies. Some of them laughed and some of them didn't, so I told myself it was just a joke, but I kept my eyes on them the rest of the evening. Maybe we should all have a night of fun sometime, and then we'll write the great American novel. That was Bill. I couldn't tell if he was joking or not. Character flaws are not the basis of great writing. Humanity, compassion, and the challenge of the unknown are what great stories are built on. I told you I liked Betty. Great stories are about facing hardship, striving for greatness against the odds, and making the world a better place than it used to be. Well, maybe if you cast the right spell, we'll save ourselves all that trouble. It was asshole Frank again. To his shame, some of the group seemed to find it amusing. I doubt Betty did, and I suspect Reggie did too. Their conversation continued about this writer's drinking habits and that writer's mistresses, and I continued to listen without giving a hand. Then I caught on to an interesting topic. Is anyone else applying for the Illinois Writers' Workshop this summer? It was Frank again. Oh, I've already applied. I hope I get accepted. Six weeks to just write and socialize with writers. This could be a real change for me. That was Karen, and it was the first I'd heard of it. Frank picked up on it right away. I'm sure they'll let you in. You've gotten a lot better at writing in the last year. I know you'll be accepted. I've applied too, but I'm not sure I'll be accepted. My bullshit meter was picked up. Really, Frank, since when have you been so humble? I didn't like what I was hearing, but at that moment I still loved and trusted my wife. When you've been married as long as we have, trust becomes fundamental. You don't ask yourself, maybe she's misbehaving? That thought doesn't cross your mind. Marriage is a team, and your partner is your better half. She proves her loyalty year after year, and all you hope for is that she gets the success and fulfillment she deserves. At least that's what you think. And then it all comes crashing down when you find out that your trust has been betrayed. As time passed, I allowed myself to forget that night's conversation. Like I said, I trusted my wife. Some young guys will never realize this, but after more than two decades of marriage, trust is as much a way of life as a choice. It was late April, and I was working in the garden, deciding I had had enough for the day and headed into the house. As I reached for the kitchen door, I heard my wife on the phone saying, I can't wait. Six whole weeks with no responsibilities, no commitments, and no one waiting for me to come home. That last phrase was memorable. 
I froze and listened. I know. This is going to be the most leisurely six weeks of my life. I owe it to myself. And so do you. Nothing about this pleased me. I opened the door and stepped into the kitchen. Karen was flabbergasted. Well, I have to go. A.B. is already here and I need to start dinner. She quickly hung up the phone. Who was that? Oh, that was Reggie. We were talking about school ending soon. Like hell it is, I thought. I wanted to ask her about the specific things she'd said, especially that no one expects me to come home, but I felt like the truth wouldn't be enough today. My mood turned somber, but I did my best to hide it. Later, after dinner, the second shoe dropped. A.B., there's no way you'll ever guess what great news I got today. Remember that writer's workshop in Illinois I applied for? No. Oh, of course you remember. You never listened to me. Truth be told, I was well aware of that workshop, but only because I had overheard her talking about it that night over a month ago. No, I don't think you ever told me about it. Yes, I did. I applied for a six-week writing workshop. It runs from mid-June through the end of July at the University of Illinois. Professors lecture there, invite great writers to workshops and discussion groups, and then we write, write, write. It's a great opportunity, and I've been accepted into the program. That sounds great, honey. I'm sure we can afford it. Maybe I can carve out some time and join you. I'd love to hear some of these writers speak. That remark seemed to take her by surprise. Oh, well, we can try. It would be a very intense six weeks, and I wouldn't have much time to spend with you. My delusion meter went off again. Well, you know I'm unpretentious, and maybe I could be the guy who brings coffee for the group. She smiled a nervous, confused smile. That would be wonderful, dear. We'll see what happens. I'd encountered this kind of deflection before, and I knew what it meant. She was going to make sure I never went to Illinois to join her. I have a feeling you'd rather I didn't go with you. Oh no, that's not it. I'm just afraid you'll be bored. You love your computers and schematics? And here is just a bunch of writers musing about great ideas. Bitch. I didn't say it out loud, but mentally I shouted it so the neighbors could hear. I'm really not stupid, honey. Oh, that's not what I meant. It's just that your mind likes to work on details, while writers struggle with the big questions of life. Double bitch. But I didn't say it out loud. I knew when someone was trying to marginalize me. I'm sure you'll succeed. Later that night, after Karen went to bed, I got on the internet to look at our phone records. At and T allows you to do that. All incoming and outgoing calls are logged along with text messages. I checked the call log, and it turns out that the call I interrupted was not from Reggie, or if it was, it was from Frank's phone. It's amazing how quickly trust can break down after 25 years of marriage when you catch your wife in a lie and find her plotting to exclude you. Weeks went by and all she talked about was the seminar. I tried several times to engage her in the idea that I might go with her or visit her at some point, but she rejected the idea each time. Then she went from reasoning to manipulation. A.B., I have the most wonderful news. I got you two tickets to a fishing camp in northern Canada at the end of June. You can take Jake and the two of you can fish for those huge fish you're always talking about. It costs a fortune, but I wanted to thank you for your insight about the writer's workshop and felt guilty that you wouldn't enjoy it. So I want you to go and have fun. And then we can compare notes when I get home. I smelled a rat. Thank you, sweetie. That was very thoughtful of you. Truth be told, I'd have more fun with you. A.B., we've been over this. It just doesn't make sense. I'll be working all the time and I'll feel guilty for ignoring you so much. I stared at her face and eyes for a minute, trying to figure out what I was seeing there. Was it condescension? Thanks, honey. It looks like it's going to be fun in Canada. I said it without much enthusiasm. Options were running through my head. An unexpected visit to Illinois was at the top of the list. Well, you could at least smile when you say that. Those tickets cost a lot of money and I want you to be happy. Okay, sounds like fun. I went down to the basement to fiddle around for the rest of the evening. Our house is old and it has one of those floor grates in the hallway. It allows hot air to come up from the furnace room and was originally used to heat the first floor. When we first moved in, I tried not to step on it unless I wanted to, but after a while I got used to it and forgot it was there. The phone is in the hallway too. I was cowering quietly in the basement and contemplating my next steps when I heard Karen calling. Yes, I gave him the tickets. He's still resisting. I don't know. 
I keep telling him he won't like it. No, I can't directly tell him to stay home. I know, and I want that too. But at the end of the day, I want to stay married. I just want him to give me some space to enjoy myself for a few weeks. I deserve that. I deserve... Yeah, I want to spend those weeks with you too. Okay, just leave it alone for a while. I think he'll come to his senses. Okay, baby, I miss you too. Write something nice for me tonight. With those words, she hung up the phone. My heart raced in my throat. I'm not stupid. I recognize cheating when I hear it. Either Karen was having an affair or she was planning one. Anything less, and she'd have a long time to explain herself. It took me 20 minutes to gather my thoughts, but I knew at this point I needed to become the liar I'd always despised. At the very least, I needed to keep my cards to myself until I figured out what I was going to do. I called upstairs and in my most loving voice said, Karen, I'm going over to Jake's house to tell him the good news. Oh, that's wonderful, dear. Have fun. And with those words, I walked out the basement door. I needed to stay away, and Jake was just an excuse. But after thinking about it, I realized that I needed someone to talk to, and Jake had been my best friend since we were in high school. You got me. Jake was never stingy with words. No way. I don't believe it. She would never cheat on you, A.V. Well, she certainly tries her best to keep me out of that workshop. And she calls someone baby, and it sure isn't me. We just sat there in silence. That's a big part of what a guy needs from another guy, just to sit next to each other and share the pain. You have to talk to her about it, A.B. You can't spend the next two months thinking the worst and not know anything. And what's she going to tell me? How much do you want to bet that tonight when I check the phone recording? It wasn't Frank she was talking to. It wasn't Frank she was calling baby. And it wasn't Frank she was scheming with? I'm sorry, I'm not taking that bet. What are you going to do? I'm going to sit down and talk it over. That's what you do after 25 years. I'm going to tell her how much I love her. Tell her I'm hurt that she doesn't want me to go with her and ask her head on what she has planned that she doesn't want me around. Do you think she'll tell the truth? No, but I'll tell her the truth and part of it won't be what she wants to hear. She'll know I love her. She'll know that cheating on me will cause us to break up. And then she'll try to convince me that it's all in my head and I should go fishing. I paused for a moment. By the way, I have two tickets to a fishing camp in northern Canada at the end of June, and one of them is for you. Nice. Jake caught himself thinking. I mean, I'm here for you, buddy. I had to laugh. I'd never doubted his loyalty. We sat around for the next three hours, talking and drinking a little bit at a time, and then I headed home. After dinner, I asked Karen to sit with me in the living room and told her everything that was on my mind. Well. I told her almost everything, but I still had a few secrets left. Honey, I'm very concerned. I don't think you've been completely honest with me about the writer's workshop. I overheard you talking to a group of writers back in March, but you never told me about it until you started planning the trip. I even heard you talk about how all great writers have novels, and I admit I didn't think it was very funny. You talked about your trip with Frank, but when I ask about it, you lie to me and say it was someone else. You know how I feel about that snake. And when you said you were accepted, you seemed to purposely push me away and didn't want me to join you. I don't need to be there, but I wanted to join you on this great adventure. Then instead of considering taking me along, you oblige me to be elsewhere so I have no choice. You never discussed the idea with me. You just obligated me. It sounds like you're trying to guarantee that I won't be in your way while you're in Illinois. I don't think you've been completely truthful with me, and I'm beginning to doubt that you've been completely faithful. A.B., I've never treated you that way, and I would never cheat on you. What is wrong with you? You are my husband, and I just want you to enjoy yourself. It hurts me that you feel that way about me. I can't help how I feel and what makes me think that way. You know that I love you. I've loved you since we met, but I could never get over the betrayal. Is this what you have planned, Karen? Is this writing workshop your vacation from marriage? And that was it. There was no more discussion or love talk. She broke into a screaming fit and spent the rest of the night either screaming or staring at me in silence. For the entire next week, she was silent. She went on the offensive, hollering at me, punishing me until I backed off. It wasn't helping. More than that, it convinced me that I was right. However, I wasn't making any progress, so in the end, I let her think she had won. If she was going to cheat, there was nothing I could do to stop her. In fact, 
That damn phone call I overheard said that she had already done it. I ended up thanking her for the trip to Canada, but my mood darkened and didn't lift again until it was over. Once she got her way, she quickly shifted gears and started playing loving wife to reinforce my desired behavior. It was as if a switch had been flipped and it only heightened my suspicions. I know what manipulation is when I fall victim to it. What do you do when you know your wife is keeping secrets and playing dumb with you? What do you do when you lose trust in a woman you've trusted half your life? Hire a private investigator, which is what I did. At the writer's workshop in Illinois was nearly 500 miles away, and I didn't know a soul there. So I asked a co-worker who he had resorted to when he caught his wife cheating. I used his recommendation, and he recommended someone in Illinois, and I contacted him. The wonderful thing about the writer's workshop was that it was held on the campus of a state university. Private investigator operatives couldn't get into the program, though they could walk by the rooms all they wanted. But the workshop participants ate in the dining halls on campus, went to local bars, and lived in a large dormitory with other students. So no one noticed the odd student hanging around with nothing to do. Some of these students would work for me, and they would have high-tech gadgets. The school year was coming to an end. Our girls decided to stay at their universities for the summer to work in research labs with professors in their specialty. This meant that we would be left as empty nesters, and I had my work cut out for me. I took her out to dinner, cooked at home, and even took her to plays. She loved it all, and I was starting to think I was winning. But whenever I told her I loved her, she would respond with a dismissive, I know. The pieces began to fall into place. She hadn't stopped loving me. She just took me for granted. I was known. I was safe. I was her security. She was sure she could go away, get a thrill, take a vacation from her marriage, and I would be here whenever she wanted. As a result, all my plans fell into place. The day she left, I decided I couldn't leave anything unsaid. We were standing at the door when her shuttle pulled up to the airport. I hugged her, told her I loved her, and said, Please don't do anything that will ruin us. She threw me an angry look and said, I'm tired of you not trusting me. When I get back, we're going to have a long conversation about this. She then gave me a quick peck on the cheek, picked up her bags, turned and walked to the shuttle. She left without even looking back at me. At that moment, I was sure my marriage was over. Twenty-five years, two grown daughters, and my marriage ended with a whimper rather than an explosion. The private investigator did his job well. He told me they made it look easy. No one tried to cover up their behavior because no one knew them there. Karen must have taken the rings off on the airplane because when she got to the workshop, they weren't on her finger. She told everyone that she had recently gotten divorced and my wife and Frank were immediately inseparable. They kissed, held hands, and snuggled up to each other like two high school seniors having their first crush. My private investigator managed to hide a small video camera in the hallway of the dorm they lived in. Karen and Frank were assigned a room each, but they only used one. Sometimes they used hers, sometimes his, but they always slept together. I knew what went on in these shared dorm rooms, but my private investigator and his team were very meticulous and left me in no doubt. One evening, before dark, my wife and Frank retired early. Two operatives, who looked like ordinary college students, sat down on the hallway floor with their backs to the wall and silently slid a miniature fisheye camera on a thin stalk under the door. They made a 20-minute videotape. I was done with that marriage. Everything else the team caught was just icing on the cake. My private investigator continued to update me regularly, but after that first week, her fate was sealed and my mind was made up. From the first days of her seminar, I used my time to carry out my plan. I became a ghost in the wind. I was disappearing or getting as close to it as I could. When she returned, I would be gone. There would be no going back, no lies, no threats, no long conversations, no explanations, no excuses, no fixes. There will only be a divorce. My marriage is over. Love doesn't die quickly, but what is love without trust? A wife who cheats has no future. Some will say my decision was weak. They will say she deserves physical punishment, total humiliation, and poverty. After all, the law would not allow me to do any of those things, and I was not going to ruin the rest of my life by trying to take revenge in this way on a cheating wife and her lover. My revenge would mean taking away the one thing she had always counted on, the one constant that had always been there to support her, to comfort her, to cheer her on and encourage her. I was taking myself away. Frank wasn't a catch. He could never support her. 
Where would a 50-year-old divorced mother look for love and emotional support? I didn't care. She would no longer be my problem. Every few days, my private investigator sent me more photos, more videos, and more facts of betrayal by someone who had promised me he would leave everyone else behind. The reports were hard to read. The photos and videos were even harder to watch. But the most painful part was listening to the audio files in which they talked about me. He texts me all the time about the big fish he's catching and how great it is out there. He thanks me almost every day. She laughed when she said this. That dumbass has no idea. Frank laughed. Well, better let him be. Treat him like a mushroom and he'll stop annoying you. Now he can have some fun. When I get home, I'm going to sick the whole force on that weirdo. How dare he accuse me of deceit? And, but you're taking a little vacation from your marriage, aren't you, beauty? Or is it a different woman in my bed every night? She giggled. She actually giggled. What a bitch. He may be right, but that doesn't mean I intend to put up with it. I'm a writer, damn it, and he's holding me back with his schematics and computer codes, his milli and micro. What does he know about big ideas? At that moment, I began to truly hate the bitch. 25 years of building a life together, raising two kids, supporting each other. And hear this. What happened to my wife? Where did she go? That woman wasn't the woman I married. She was some stranger who took on my wife's appearance. She was some vile alien with no heart, no soul. Where was her love? Where was her compassion? Where the hell was her decency? Did she not remember the years we'd lived together and the life we'd created together? Did none of that really matter? No, obviously none of it mattered. She wanted her affair, and she was going to get it at any cost. After all, she was living the life of a writer, and she was due her greatness. There wasn't much I could do about it now, but I was determined that when it was over, she would have only her affair. I contemplated every conceivable form of revenge, up to and including public humiliation. I knew that none of those forms would bring me satisfaction as long as my life was tied to her life. There was only one option left, and I began the process of turning from human to ghost. I sat down with my boss and told him everything. He was very understanding. He had gone through something similar himself a few years earlier and quickly got me transferred to the company's office in Portland, Maine. I liked the idea. I knew the people in that office. They were professional, capable, and I liked them. I liked the city and the state. I called the movers and arranged to ship half of the furniture and all of my personal belongings north. I repaired the car and got it ready for the trip. Then I sat down at the table with my attorney and started preparing the paperwork. Karen had her own insurance and retirement account, so I took her name out of all of mine and listed my daughters as beneficiaries. I signed a quitclaim deed so she could have the house, but in exchange there would be no alimony. She will get her car, but will have to buy her own insurance. I saved the bank accounts for the last few days and the cards for the end. There was no need to tip me. From that point on, all I could do was reinforce my thoughts. What do I mean? I tried calling her to ask how the seminar was going and to tell her I loved her. I thought hearing her lie would help remind me that I was doing the right thing. She didn't let me down. She was full of enthusiasm, confessed her love, and ran off to dinner, all in less than two minutes. My PI later told me that Frank had been sitting next to her the whole time, and they were exchanging smiles, rolling their eyes, and generally disparaging comments about me. That helped a lot. It was all a joke to her, and I had no doubt that I was doing the right thing. From that point on, I sent her text messages instead of phone calls. I didn't believe I could keep my composure over the phone. I was telling her how the fish were biting, but what I was really doing was sending Jake and his beautiful wife on a trip. They loved it. Jake had a successful marriage. Before I left, I stopped by to say goodbye to both of them, and they promised to come visit me. As her six weeks came to an end, I completed the last of my assignments. A realtor friend gave me a for sale sign to hang in the front yard. I couldn't actually sell the house without her permission, and I had already deeded it to her. But she didn't know that. When she came home, this was the first thing she saw. I changed the locks on the house to make her feel like she didn't live there anymore, printed out some photos from her trip, including the most explicit footage from that video shot under Frank's door, and made a copy of the private investigator's report. I left it all on the dining room table so she'd know she was caught. The movers had already taken most of what I wanted and left it in storage until I was ready. 
I only took with me two suitcases, a briefcase, my laptop, and my guitar. The guitar had to be with me. I couldn't trust someone else with such an expensive item. I planned to leave the next morning until she returned by late afternoon. That way I would be gone by the time she arrived. But the night before, I had a last-minute change of heart. I wanted the pain to start now, when all she had to do was wait and worry until she got home. I enclosed three pictures of her and Frank with the words, I'm divorcing you, I'm divorcing you, I'm divorcing you, and sent them to my soon-to-be ex-wife. I chose the one where they were almost copulating on the dance floor. You could see she wasn't wearing a wedding or engagement ring. The second one showed them walking hand-in-hand hand to his dorm room. The third one I took from the dorm room video where her face was clearly visible. I figured she'd see them, and maybe it would ruin her last romantic night with good old Frankie while they ran around looking for the cameras they'd already put away. I then turned off the phone. With the announcement made, I carried the last suitcase to the car and carefully stowed the guitar in the passenger seat. After looking around the house one last time, I picked up my phone, took a quick picture, and got behind the wheel. You probably thought I was driving one of those big diesel F250 pickup trucks with all the extras. You think I started the engine and the dishes rang in my neighbor's house. Weren't you listening? I'm an engineer. I like technology. I'd drive a Tesla if I got paid more, so I drive a hybrid. I hit the start button, the dials came to life, and I heard nothing. It's a hybrid. I released the parking brake, put it in gear, and drove away from my house one last time so quietly that no neighbor would know I was gone. I was a ghost on the wind, moving silently through the world, leaving betrayal behind me. Leaving the house that had been our home for so many years, the home where we raised our daughters, was simultaneously the most painful, the most uncertain, and the most liberating experience of my life. From a practical standpoint, my wife died. I didn't know when or why, but she was dead to me as surely as if I had pulled the trigger myself. The woman who remained, who looked like my wife, was not someone I knew or wanted to know again. I was starting life anew with an unknown future. I was experiencing a profound sense of loss, and at the same time it was strangely liberating. The burden of lies, betrayal, and humiliation was lifted from my shoulders, if only temporarily. The only price I had paid was that half of my life was now lost to me. It was getting late, but I was worked up so I calmly drove a hundred miles down the highway in the company of only my thoughts until I found a hotel for the night. That's how I found myself over the Virginia border. I decided that after dropping the bomb on Karen, there was no reason for me to watch the results in real time, so I turned off my phone. I would find out later if my message had made any difference to her. Either way, I was leaving my old life behind, and her reaction wasn't worth the bother. I got a room, grabbed a small bag and guitar from the car, and fell asleep surprisingly quickly. I slept better that night than I had in months. When I got up, I took a long shower and went in search of a good locally produced breakfast. I wasn't looking for any mains. I wanted a real diner. I needed something real. I found it and got what will likely be my last serving of grits for a very long time. That grits got me thinking, and I began to rethink my trip to Maine. It was the first day of my revival, and I had a long drive ahead of me. I could have rushed to Maine, running away from all my problems, but I had two weeks before I had to go to work. Why rush? I needed time to calm down, come to terms with her betrayal, and put the past behind me. I decided to drive leisurely, enjoying the countryside as I traveled north and exploring each state and its people as I passed. It was a week of transitioning from my old life to my new one. I was going to indulge my taste buds and other senses to cleanse myself of all that was ugly and wrong in my old life and prepare for a new beginning. Virginia was the first day of my new life, and that meant I set out in search of Smithfield Ham. I turned east and headed toward Williamsburg, taking a few sensible steps that took me into the backcountry of southern Virginia. I managed to drive straight through Smithfield, where I found a lunch steeped in regional tradition and history before taking the car ferry across the James. At this time of year, the James is quiet and peaceful, not a breath of wind or ripple on the surface. Standing at the rail of the ferry and looking out over the river, I began to hum, the end of the earth, softly. Under the early morning moon, the road runs along the James. Something is calling me on the road, though I can't remember its name. I went off the beaten path when I first left home. I've never walked alone to any place other than my own path. I walk past your window. I don't cast a shadow. I speak, but I am not heard. My words fall silently over the edge of the earth. 
the immobility felt like death, and I began to think that being a ghost was not the solution I needed. It was a bad omen for my future, and for a while, the loss of my former life consumed me. I spent the rest of the day walking around Williamsburg with the crowds of people that fill the town in the summer, and stopping by the wonderful artisans and craftsmen doing their thing. I even caught an impromptu student performance in the Brick Plaza at the top of Duke of Gloucester Street. Being surrounded by people and activity again cleansed me and lifted my spirits. For the first time since leaving home, I felt relaxed. The city was full of hotels, and with a little effort I managed to find a room despite having no reservations. It wasn't until I had eaten a light dinner and settled in for the night that my thoughts finally returned to my failed marriage. She was just coming home. I wonder what she'll think when she sees the for sale sign on the front lawn and her keys won't unlock the door. The next day I turned north and drove through the backcountry toward Annapolis, the capital of Maryland, past small towns and old plantations along Virginia's ancestral rivers like the York, Rappahannock, and Potomac, which flow into the Chesapeake Bay. This is the land of the Revolution and the Civil War. Bobby Lee's daddy, Light Horse Harry Lee, had a place next to the road. As I drove through the back roads past the corn and cantaloupe farms, my thoughts returned to the house in Raleigh, to the life left behind, and I wondered why things had come to this. However, the point of this trip was to take my mind off those thoughts to some degree, so I tried to focus on the road and the countryside. The road and my thoughts seemed to merge into one. Ahead was a single ribbon of asphalt that led me toward my future. I would follow that winding ribbon as it led me away from betrayal and toward a new life. I left Williamsburg early and slipped quietly into Annapolis in time for a lunch of crab cakes and local beer. That lifted my spirits. I wandered the waterfront looking at the boats, chatted with locals and passing sailors, and sat down to lunch of steamed crabs and beer. Can anything say more clearly about Maryland than that? I sat at a picnic table with four people I didn't know, and we became fast friends because steamed crab picking is a slow process that leaves plenty of time for conversation. We told each other our life story, and by the end of the conversation, they knew about my impending divorce, and I knew the name of each grandchild. At one point, as we talked about life and marriage, I saw myself through their eyes. I must have really looked like an odd duck. I left my wife, left my home, and drove across the state, slowly traveling north alone. I told them that her lies and betrayal had caused me to pull away from her and our life together, and that sampling the cuisine of each state and meeting people by driving through them was my way of measuring off the miles and moving on, taking it to the next level and leaving the past behind. I had no intention of going back. My life as I knew it was over and a new life had begun. They seemed to understand me, wished me well, and as we parted, I thanked them for their company. Sitting in my hotel room in downtown Annapolis, I finally picked up my cell phone and turned it on. No surprise there. It was full of missed calls, emails, and text messages. Most of them were from Karen, and a few were from friends. I read and listened to them all. It was hard, but it had to be done. At first, Karen tried to tell me that all was not as it seemed. Of course it wasn't. They were messages she had sent from Illinois before she got home, saw the rest of the pictures, and read a copy of the private investigator's report. My friends told me that Karen was now calling everyone trying to find me. She was just looking in the wrong place. Jake and his wife knew, but I purposely left the rest of them in the dark. I'll tell them as soon as I get settled. I already knew I couldn't play the ghost forever. The two calls that scared me were from my daughters. Karen was calling them, trying to find out where I was. I purposely didn't tell them I was leaving their mother because I wanted to do it in person, but I couldn't let them worry. So I called the girls and calmly explained to them what was going on. They were upset and couldn't believe their mom could do such a thing. So I sent them the same pictures I had sent Karen the night I left home, as well as the private investigator's report for them to read. After that, they vowed not to tell my mother what I was doing. There was another missed call. My attorney informed me that Karen had been served with divorce papers. Now she knew I was serious. He also informed me that Frank's wife had received a complete set of photos, video, and audio recordings from his six-week seminar. Take that, Frank. On the third day, I drove through Northern Maryland and then arrived in New Jersey with great anticipation. Yes, that's right. I took the Jersey line and didn't stop until I got to Connecticut. Once in Connecticut, I carved out a few hours to drive through the historic towns along the coast. I wasn't looking for anything special, 
but the architecture was so starkly different from North Carolina that I had a very strong sense of being in a new place, both physically and emotionally. And don't tell the government, but I spent an hour in Groton trying to see as many submarines as possible. Boy, how well they hide those blackfish. As I looked up and down the coast, I remembered that when nuclear boats are refueled, they cut a hole in the hull to refuel the reactor and then weld the hull back together. Was this a metaphor for me? Was Karen's betrayal, which punched a hole in my heart, nothing more than the first step to refueling my life? Would I be able to heal myself as my new life began? I spent the night in a small motel near Mystic. After three days of driving, with only my thoughts to keep me company, I began to ponder again the genesis of my failed marriage. It had failed not in those six weeks of betrayal in Illinois. It began to fail a year before that, when the last of our daughters moved out. It failed when she didn't want me to be a part of her writing life, when she stopped reading her work to me, and when she made me feel unwelcome when her writer's club gathered at our house. It all went downhill when she started keeping secrets and making plans for six weeks without telling me. Was she looking for a fresh start, or did she need to feel some independence while enjoying the security of a devoted husband? Did she decide that with the girls grown and out of the house, the marriage had served its purpose and it was time to start a new life? Did I become a liability to her or just didn't matter? We got married right out of college. I assume she went from her father's house to mine right away. Did she? Did she never really stand on her own two feet? God knows her authority in our house was unquestioned. Was this my big mistake? Had I devalued myself by trying to provide her with the life she wanted? Or had she reached a point where living together had become too restrictive for her? I had more questions than answers, but the saddest truth was that I doubted I would ever get an honest answer from her if I asked. And if I asked and got the truth, what would it matter? I had so defined myself as her husband that the thought of cheating on her was unthinkable. And yet she had not only found it possible, but had degraded me to her lover. For a brief moment, I pictured their conversation into my pillow. But these images were too painful to contemplate, and I pushed them out of my mind. It was these thoughts that rushed through my brain as I sank into sleep, and I slept poorly that night. On the fourth day, I went to the museum, walked the decks of the Morgan, talked to the guides, and checked out some of the construction details of their fantastic collection of small boats. I told you I was an avid sailor until family life took over, didn't I? I finished my visit at the museum store and bought a few last books to add to my collection. I needed something to occupy my time on these cold winter evenings in Maine. What did I eat in Connecticut? I don't know if you can believe it, but Connecticut claims to be the birthplace of the hamburger. Who am I to argue? So I had a pretty good burger and hit the road. I left my phone off because I wasn't in the mood to listen to my wife cheat, and I had a meeting with my daughter scheduled. As I sat in my room, I had a weird moment of clarity when I realized that it was a good thing I wasn't getting divorced more often. I could have gained some serious weight doing that. Regardless, the trip gave me what I needed. I had quiet time when I wanted to reflect on my life, and distractions and plans when I didn't. By taking the time to drive north, I was taking the time to put the past behind me and prepare to start my life anew. When I got up on day five, I knew it was going to be the hardest day yet. After eating a breakfast of scrambled eggs and bacon and toast and washing it down with good black coffee, I headed to Brown and a terribly painful conversation with my oldest daughter, Claire. The drive didn't take long, and in the late morning I met her outside her dorm. We agreed to put our conversation on hold, so she could pretend to be happy for at least an hour or two. She showed me around campus and then took me to the cafeteria, where she introduced me to all of her friends. They were exactly the young men and women I hoped she would find. They were pleasant, attentive, and seemed to be mutually supportive. As we were leaving, I took her roommate aside and told her that Claire was going to have a rough day. I asked her to watch my daughter. She replied, Yes, Mr. Baker, she told us that last night. We are all here for her. Yes. My daughter has chosen her friends well. We sat in Claire's dorm room and talked for hours. I showed her pictures and played audio recordings I never thought I would ever share with my child. She alternated between sadness and rage. I can't believe she did this. Is this really the same woman who raised us? What kind of filthy tramp has she become? I had to stop her, though I agreed. Claire, no matter what she did, she's still your mother. Besides, it was me she betrayed, not you. I'm sorry to disagree with you, Dad, but she destroyed my only family. She definitely did that to me. I couldn't argue with that. 
We talked until lunchtime and I told her all my plans. I told her to gather her friends and we went out for the best dinner in town, or the best I could afford. Everyone seemed happy to take a break from the dining room menu. I told them stories about my dining hall adventures when I was in college, and I think they went back to their dorms with a new appreciation for their current situation. I got a room in town, and the next morning I had breakfast with my daughter, hugged her to tears, and then headed north to Boston to do it all over again. Claire must have called Denise, because the latter took the news much better than her older sister. There was just as much frustration and anger in her, but much less surprise. She asked for proof, and I showed it to her. Fortunately, her mother had called during our conversation, and I gave her the universal, no, I'm not here, sign. I shook my head, waved my arms like a madman, and ran my finger across my throat like a knife. She nodded. Denise had always been the less dramatic member of the family. Then she did something I thought I'd never see. She said, Dad called last night. Is it true you've become a slut who cheats on her husband and lies about it? I was at a loss for words. I wanted to tell her off for talking to her mother like that, but at the same time I had to agree with what she said. You heard me, Mom. You spent six weeks being some creep's girlfriend while your husband stayed home alone. Was it worth it, Mom? Was it worth losing your marriage over? Oh, crap. That daughter of mine has a mouth. Remind me never to piss her off. After that, the conversation was short-lived. Denise told me that her mother mostly cried and tried to make excuses when she could, but my daughter wasn't buying it. Later, I took her and her friends to a Thai restaurant near campus called Elephant Walk. Like her sister, Denise picked her friends well, and the dinner was very enjoyable. As we were walking back to campus, one of her friends said, Mr. Baker, Denise told us what you're going through. She was very sad last night, but we supported her. I hope you will come back someday and let us take you to the cafeteria. That made the rest of the friends laugh. Well, actually, maybe we can find a better place than this. That elicited giggles, and we laughed all the way back to her dorm. I found a room for the night, took my daughter to breakfast in the morning, and continued north on the seventh day. I left Boston and was only two hours south of Portland. Now I thought less about my soon-to-be ex-wife and more about my daughters. They were growing up to be strong, principled girls, and I was very proud of them. I knew now that they would survive the impending divorce better than I had feared. This day was hard because of the fact that I was leaving these two wonderful jewels behind me with no promise of when I would see them again. Turns out I shouldn't have worried. I wasn't ready to face the reality of starting a new life yet, so after reaching Portsmouth, New Hampshire, I turned west and headed for the White Mountains and Presidential Range. I drove into the White Mountains and took the Cog Railroad to the top of Mount Washington. As I stood there, looking across the hollow at the smaller peaks of the White Mountains and scanning the green pine forest below, feeling the cold chill of the Arctic winds that are so misplaced in the first days of August, I finally felt reborn. I stood alone, but at last I was standing. I had passed through the birth canal of the mid-Atlantic states, moving from an old life of pain and regret to a new life and all the possibilities it held. Now I stood on high ground, ready to begin life anew. Everything I could ever want lay before me. In the morning, I was brought a plate of pancakes with real maple syrup. I was now in maple syrup country and would be for years to come. Rested and ready, I got in my car and drove to Portland. I got there in the middle of the afternoon and decided to meet with my new boss to let him know I had arrived. I already knew about half of the office staff, and I was warmly welcomed. It was a pleasant experience. They were the first happy, relaxed faces I had seen in a week. My new boss's name is Henry, and he gathered the entire office to greet me. I was quickly given a tour of the store, but only after everyone had made a collective decision on where we would all go for dinner. I assumed it would be a restaurant downtown, but we ended up at Henry's house where steaks were grilled with all the condiments. I know I should have tasted lobster in Maine, but I had all the time in the world for that. It was about reintegrating into society. Over amazingly tasty steaks and great local beer, they asked me to tell them about myself. What was a Southern guy doing, dropping everything and moving to Maine at this stage of his life? So I told them. I left out all the details, but gave them enough information for them to understand. At the end, I ask them, I may be a little testy in the coming weeks. It's out of my character, but I have a lot to work through. I hope that if I misbehave, you will tell me and ask me to stop. I need a little pushback from time to time. I wasn't expecting it, 
But every woman hugged me and kissed my cheek, and every man put his arm around my shoulders. We're here for you, A.B. That was all they said, and all they needed to say. That night, settled in my hotel room, I turned on my cell phone again. The girls had texted me with words of encouragement. They must have given my number to their friends because I had at least eight or ten more messages from young men and women who appreciated the dinner and wanted me to know they would be there for my daughters. I love those kids. A few friends kept getting in touch, so I decided to contact them all and tell them what was going on so they would stop worrying. I didn't tell them where I was. That would come later. I only told them about why I left. They didn't want to believe it, so I sent them the same three pictures I had sent Karen and told them I had much worse if that didn't convince them. I thought about it, but I honestly didn't see any reason to defend her from her own decisions. I had already tried and failed, so let the chips fall. Over time, I received messages of love and support from them all and promised to stay in touch. It quickly became clear to me that my plans to become a ghost were just a fantasy. Too many people cared about me, and that's a good thing. I read the remaining text messages from Karen and listened to the missed calls. She had finally admitted what she had done, but her confession was colored by strange bursts of anger. She somehow blamed me for what she had done, for what I had done, and for everything that had happened. Well, screw that shit. I texted her and told her I'd call her the next day at noon. It was bound to happen sooner or later. Let's just say it was an unsatisfying conversation. She alternated between accusations, blame, and denial. She was sorry. Frank's personality was overwhelming her. I was suffocating her. It was my fault because I was working too hard. It was nothing like that. They were just fooling around, but nothing serious. I almost burst out laughing when she told me she was just trying to find her muse. She even accused me of turning our daughters against her as if her own actions hadn't led to this without my help. When she finally stopped talking, I laid it out plain and simple for her. She had conspired with Frank to cheat on me. She had resisted my attempts to keep us together. She had committed treason, and now she was paying the price. I no longer cared why. When I hung up the phone, she was still crying and defending her righteousness. I was done with her. There was no going back. I knew too much. I found a simple but comfortable two-bedroom apartment in an old building within walking distance of the office. I figured I could use the exercise and thought it would be temporary, but my thoughts soon changed. I could live simply in the city, avoiding the extra work associated with the house, and rent a small cottage on the coast for the weekends. Then I thought, why a cottage? I could buy a boat, keep it in the harbor, and that would be my cottage on the coast. By the time I realized all this, it was early fall. I expected to live a lonely life, but it didn't really turn out that way. I see my daughters more often now than when I lived in Raleigh. They come at least one weekend every month and always bring a few friends with them. For 36 hours, my apartment turns into a beehive, and somehow I always manage to have them all over for dinner. By the time they leave, I desperately need some peace and quiet, though I miss them as soon as they walk out the door. I've also been surprised that a few of my friends have come to visit me, and the rest of them promise to come when the weather gets better. I live alone, but I'm not lonely. I have an increasing number of new friends, both from work and my adventures. The seafaring community here is vibrant and welcoming, and I've met some interesting women in my wanderings, but I'll be on my best behavior until the marriage is officially and legally dissolved. I still hear from Karen, even though the divorce will soon be final. She's never really repented and prefers to say I'm too much. All she says is, everyone does it. It doesn't mean anything. Yes, it does. Sex means a lot, and lies and manipulation mean even more. I thought about explaining it to her, but people change and I didn't see the point anymore. The truth is, I haven't been able to completely separate my life from hers. With two daughters and many mutual friends, I know that will never happen. However, with 600 miles between us, I no longer live with the daily rejection and betrayal. She was the most important being in my life until I was no longer hers. Now I have my own life and future to build on my own. A few good things have come out of all this. First of all, I really like it here. I'm experiencing my first main winter, and it's a bit of a shock. But if they can do it, so can I. It gets dark early here, but in a way that makes sitting indoors warmer and brighter. I started looking for a boat and found a boatyard with docks just outside of town so I think I'll be able to splice fishing line and apply varnish in the spring. The restaurants here are good, the micros are great, 
and the people are genuine. There's music of all kinds, dancing if you're willing to learn contradance, and surprises I'm still discovering. I think life is going to favor me after all. Is my heart refueled? Not yet, but time heals, and I know a better life lies ahead. Oh, and Frank's wife seems to be a dinosaur as stuck in the past as I am. She kicked his worthless ass out of the house and divorced him. Worse, both Karen and Frank remained unpublished. Part 2 I was married to a woman named Karen until the day came when I stopped being a wife. I've told you before how that happened. This is the story of how I made a new life for myself and eventually found love again. My wife cheated on me with a lowlife. A man who was married and had two children, yet cheated on his own wife when he went to bed with mine. She tried to hide her cheating, but she couldn't hide her growing disrespect for me. My wife was a frustrated writer, and as our two girls left for college, her attention gradually shifted from our marriage to writing and then to this other adventure. I spent 25 years devoted to her, our girls, and our life together. But once the girls left, I seemed to become unimportant to her. I think she began to see me as an obstacle to writing success, as if it was my fault that no publisher was interested in her work. I suppose every unsuccessful artist needs someone to blame, as long as the blame doesn't fall on themselves. But I think the truth has more to do with the fact that I was successful and happy in my career, and she never was. I don't know when the affair began, but I do know that within six weeks she was sharing a bed with Frank. I know that nothing I tried could dissuade her from the betrayal, and that once I committed it, I could never put it behind me again. So I became the ghost of my marriage. While she was away enjoying fantasies of being a great, albeit aspiring writer, and sharing a bed with Frank, I packed my things and set out for my new destination. I got a transfer from my company's office in Raleigh, North Carolina, to an office in Portland, Maine, and spent a week driving around highways and back roads on my way to my new life. I sampled regional cuisine, talked to people, and took in the sights along the way. I thought that with enough time and distractions, I could erase her memory from my mind. I was wrong. I also spent two days with my beautiful and amazing daughters, who were in college at Brown and Boston University, trying to explain to them what had happened and why I could never stay with their mother. They understood and supported me. I eventually made it to Portland, where I met other engineers and technicians in my new office and rented a two-bedroom apartment near work. Well, that should bring you up to speed regarding my life at that point. Eventually, things settled down. It didn't take me long to realize that I would enjoy living in Portland. It was mid-August when I got settled, so it was still summer. There were several sailors in my office, and they quickly introduced me to other sailors, so before long, I was well into the sailing life. Any skipper is usually looking for a capable crew, and I quickly became familiar with sailing. Sailing is like riding a bicycle. When you haven't ridden one for a long time, you can be a bit frazzled at first, but it all comes back quickly. By September, I had become a regular crew member on a J-24 yacht racing in Casco Bay, and we were doing pretty well until the fall season closed and the yacht was put away for the season. Admittedly, I was head over heels in work, and I am familiar with the admonition that all work and no play. But such is the life of a single man over 50 who lives alone. I'm not a big drinker, so I find bars somewhat tedious if I'm out alone. One or two nights a week I'd meet up with someone from work or the sailing community, and we'd have dinner and a beer or two. Other nights I cooked by myself, and on those nights I worked from home both for something to do and everything else. I know that sounds boring, but I had a lot to think about while my lawyer was working on my divorce, and a man can think too much when it comes to things like that. Better to have something to occupy my thoughts. My wife, Karen, called far more often than I would have liked, considering I wanted the calls to go away. Each call only reopened a wound that was slowly healing. She tried everything I expected and some things I didn't even imagine. She made promises, but what are promises when vows are broken? She threatened, but she had no more leverage over me. She missed and loved me, and in some twisted way I did think she did, but not enough to be faithful. She begged, but every time she did, I remembered those images of her in bed with Frank and my sympathy for her evaporated. She even threatened to come to Portland and bring me back, but I convinced her that she wouldn't be warmly received. I didn't want to threaten her or treat her with hatred for what she had done but I would do it if it was necessary. Love dies slowly, even when trust is broken. But now I couldn't go back to her. It's been summer, and I've always heard about fall in New England. But until you experience it, you think it's just pretty leaves. 
It's apple picking, outdoor concerts and fairs, and I had a growing legion of friends to share it with. I'm addicted to fresh squeezed apple cider, pleasantly warm sunny days with cool nights, and a palpable sense that something big is just around the corner. Winter in Maine is definitely something big. I tried to prepare for it by wearing warm clothes and heavy boots, but I still had a lot to learn. All this time and with every call, Karen was hiding some secret from me. When Frank's wife kicked him out of the house, he moved in with Karen. This little nugget of deception was told to me by my loving daughters, who I convinced to keep in contact with their mother. She wasn't much of a wife, but she was a good mother to the girls. And even at their age, girls need a mom sometimes. The girls learned about Frank from their grandmother. The first week I was gone, Karen called almost everyone we knew trying to find me. The only people she didn't call were my parents, her parents, and our siblings. I suppose that would have raised too many questions. Soon, probably from our mutual friends, word got out that I was missing, and her mother came to comfort her daughter. You can imagine her surprise when she discovered that a strange man was living with her daughter in the house that had shortly before been my home. As usual, my wife's explanation was less than truthful, and after five decades of knowing her daughter, my mother-in-law found Karen's lies transparent. Karen's mother told my daughters about it with some trepidation, and they patiently, if not tactfully, retold the story of my betrayal. As it turned out, their grandmother had called her daughter a word I'd never heard her use before and for which her husband would have punched me in the face if I'd ever used it toward his daughter. Funny how quickly life can change. October passed, and Halloween was fast approaching. My girls came to visit me at least one weekend every month, but Halloween is not a school holiday and they stuck around at school. Still, I know they went to class in their costumes and sent me selfies for fun, but I wish I had been there for them. There were young families all around me, and the night I opened the door and greeted all those young ghouls and pretty ballerinas, my spirits rose to their highest point since I left Raleigh. Karen's calls were getting less frequent, but their tone didn't change. She fought the divorce. Eventually, my attorney threatened to release the most damaging and embarrassing evidence my private investigator had gathered, and that's when Karen gave up. She stopped fighting the divorce and began negotiating to get as much of our assets as possible. Eventually, she had no more cards left to play, but it took months. As painful as betrayal can be, after 25 years of marriage, you greet the realization that it's about to end with genuine regret and a terrible sense of loss. It didn't make me change my mind, but like a death in the family, I grieved. My life went on and got better. Thanksgiving was approaching, and my daughters decided to spend it with me. As with every trip, they took some friends with them. On this trip, it was mostly friends who couldn't make it home for the holiday, and since both daughters were there at the same time, we had a full house. Those who didn't sleep in the spare bedroom took sleeping bags with them and stretched out on the floor. It was a women's group, so I just went to bed in my room and quietly prayed, reminding myself that they had every day on campus to do things I hoped they wouldn't do in my apartment. I tried to make a traditional Thanksgiving dinner, but the women wouldn't let me do it. Dad, we'll manage. Go enjoy the game. Two smiling young women who were not my daughters took me by the shoulders, turned me around and escorted me out. With those words, I departed, leaving the cooking in their capable hands. From time to time, I glanced into the kitchen and what I saw could only be described as directed chaos. It was a joyous sight. Dinner was delicious and delightful, and I soon realized that my only job was to ask questions that encouraged everyone to tell me stories about school, their lives, and home. The conversation around the table was lively. I learned about the guys who disappointed me and the girls who didn't. Some of the conversation was in code, but I wasn't old enough not to understand. After dinner, I tried to organize a long walk in the cold November air, but only the women joined me. The game on TV was too exciting for young men, and young women, I confess, interested me much more. I enjoyed their company, and when the young men returned to the apartment, the girls told me a few more details about their boyfriends, both past and present. It was then that Jenny spilled every last penny to my daughter. How is your relationship with Ben going? Who's Ben? I asked, in the almost sing-song tone that parents use to ferret out their daughter's secrets. Men, you know how young women look when they're on a roll, but still confident and cheerful? That was the look in every one of them, except for my daughter, who was clearly doing calculations in her head. She still thought she could bluff. Oh, he's just a boy from school. Just a boy? You get along with all the boys? I try to... I mean, not like that. I mean... 
Dad. Yeah? God, she'd gotten caught. Okay. Ben is just someone I met in my digital circuits class last semester. He's a serious student, and I think you'll like him. Claire says he's also a good dancer, Mr. Baker. That made them burst into giggles. Okay. So this Ben is a serious student, a good dancer, and you think I'll like him. So why haven't I met him? I was starting to feel like it was six of them against one, and this time I was on the side of six. It's too soon, Dad. Besides, he had to go home to be with his family. And where is that? Okay, I was teasing her a little, but Dad has certain responsibilities and I liked that. Pennsylvania. And what are his parents like? Oh, they're really nice. And then the look of shock on her face told me she realized she hadn't just gotten caught. So you've met them? Yes. And they're nice? Yes. But it's too soon? I'll work on it. I knew at this point that her friends would handle it much better than I would, so I left the subject for now. I had a good opinion of my daughter's friends, and they seemed to like this young man. Plus, I knew both my daughters had a good head on their shoulders, so I was sure I shouldn't worry too much. Vacation passed, and my traveling band of gypsies headed south to their schools, leaving my batteries charged and my heart full. Life continued to seem better and better. I would need every bit of that joy and the full support of my daughters for what lay ahead. Christmas. Before my girls left for school, we had a long discussion about what to do about Christmas vacation. Karen was already furious that Claire and Denise had come to Maine for Thanksgiving instead of traveling to North Carolina to be with her. Forget the fact that Maine is three hours away and Raleigh is a full day away. It was all about Karen. We decided that I would buy the tickets and we would all fly back to Raleigh for Christmas. I'll stay with my parents, who are in their 70s, and there's no telling how many more years we'll spend together, and my girls will stay wherever they see fit. They decided to stay with their mother and visit friends and both grandparents whenever possible. For my part, I agreed to reconcile with my soon-to-be ex-wife and socialize with her parents, who had always liked me. Can I say it was a trip to hell and back? No, I don't think that's enough. The family decided that each of the grandparents would spend their own Christmas Eve. I'll be with my family, the girls will spend time with both of them, and toward the evening I'll visit my mother-in-law. I agreed to spend Christmas morning with Karen and the girls, and then talk to her privately before I left. It felt more like a canoodle than a holiday, but it all needed to be done. I needed to figure out my relationship with Karen, and figure out what kind of relationship I might have with her family in the future. There was no getting away from that. Karen and I had daughters in common, and someday we would have sons-in-law and grandchildren. Our paths would cross year after year, and I was determined not to ruin any family holidays with a fight with my soon-to-be ex. My daughters and I flew to Raleigh separately and arrived late in the morning two days before Christmas, each flying out of airports close to school and home, and I rented two cars. One was rented by me and the other by the girls. They were staying longer than I was, and I figured they would want independence to see their friends and might need to get away from their mother's ranting at some point. Before leaving the airport, we sat down at a cafe and clarified our plans. Just a few minutes of chatting with these two sweet and energetic young women put my thoughts in order. I immediately decided that I was going to enjoy the vacation the best I could and not let Karen ruin it for either of us. After signing the rental papers, loading the suitcases, and getting one last couple of hugs, I quietly watched these two sweet and very mature girls drive away. I know they have a lot of independence in school, but there's nothing like a car to make a young person feel completely independent and free. Watching them drive away, I felt that they would enjoy these days no matter what else happened. I made it to my parents' house and settled in for a quiet conversation. They were interested in my new life in Maine, made a few disparaging remarks about Northerners, and I assured them I had survived the Maine winter. Dad is a retired engineer, so we chatted about business for a while. Mom wondered if I was eating right. What can I say? Once you become a kid in my mom's house, you're a kid for life. I guess that's how she shows her love. Eventually, we got to the elephant in the room. So, we had a long and very painful conversation with Karen's parents. Apparently, her mother met the man she is now living with. I assume you know something about that? Yes, Mom. It's Frank, the man she cheated with. Well, Betty didn't like him at all. She said he gave her the creeps when he tried to be charming and sweet. She said he looked like a man who would steal her purse if he had the chance. Well, he stole my wife, so the purse doesn't seem like such a big deal. You know your mom and I were really worried about you that first week you were gone. 
We had no idea where you were or if you were even alive. Please don't do that to us again, son. I won't, Dad. I'm sorry for what I did. I wanted to disappear so Karen would never find me, and I'm afraid I took the all-or-nothing approach. It was crazy. I should have known I couldn't disappear for real, and I didn't want you to worry. I promise I'll never do that again. I assume you're done with her? There's no going back? Never. I'm done. I know I didn't give you enough detail about what happened, but I found out that she might be planning to cheat on me about a month and a half before she left town for a writing seminar in Illinois. I still don't know if she had cheated on me before that, but for the six weeks she spent at the seminar, she slept in Frank's bed and acted like they were newlyweds. I tried everything I could to keep her from going or let me go with her, but I couldn't stop her. I was never sure if she would cheat until she did. But in the last six weeks before the seminar, I had a bad feeling about it. I even begged her not to do anything that could ruin our marriage, but she only rebuked me for my suspicions. Once she did that, the marriage was over as far as I was concerned. Even if I could forgive her, and in all this time she has never once apologized to me, I don't know how I could ever trust her again. I'm sorry, Dad. But the marriage is over. My father took a pause to gather his thoughts. Okay. I'll say this in front of your mother, so she can't accuse me of saying it behind her back. If I were in your shoes, I'd do the same thing. You old goat, if I were in his shoes, I'd do it faster and cut your balls off in the process. Mom has a way with words. Dad looked at Mom and smiled. It's nice to feel wanted. Mom just hummed and clapped Dad on the knee. Are you going to see her on this trip? I don't think I can avoid it. Maybe we can clear the air and start building a new relationship so I don't have to be a burden to the girls. I promise to spend Christmas morning with Claire and Denise, and after the girls go off to their friends, I'll talk to Karen. Maybe she'll realize that we both need to be allowed to move on with our lives. Geez, is that it? Merry Christmas. I think Dad realized what kind of Christmas celebration awaited me. I promise to see her family on Christmas Eve after we have dinner. The girls have promised to have dinner with us first and then go there with me, so it won't be too stressful. I wouldn't worry about it being bad. Karen's mother is still furious about her behavior. As soon as she found out what Karen did, she practically disowned her. Now she thinks you're some kind of saint for being so forgiving. I'm forgiving? I ran away before she got home and moved 600 miles away to be away from her. A.B., you left her the damn house. And with her teacher's salary, it's the only home she'll ever have. That shows how smart I am, Dad. I left her the house and just as fast she moved Frank in there. I heard that Frank's wife is divorcing him. Mom, how are you hearing all this? I'm a good listener and Karen's mom likes to talk. Right now her favorite topic of conversation is how her idiot daughter traded away and lost a good man. I've always liked her. So it's true? What's true? That I gave Frank's wife everything I had on their affair? You bet it's true. Mom only shook her head as if disapproving but a wry smile gave away her true feelings. Dad laughed outright. The day went better from there. I helped them do a few chores around the house that they'd been putting off, and we put up the last of the decorations. I told them about my life and new friends in Portland, while they filled me in on everything I'd missed since leaving Raleigh. Then, I helped with dinner. It was a very enjoyable afternoon and evening. In the morning, I helped clean the house for the guests, set the dining room table, and prepare the food. Christmas Eve dinner was set for 2 p.m., and by the time the food was ready, the house was filled with everyone I hadn't seen in many months. My brother and sister arrived with food, family, and kisses, and a few cousins and friends dropped by unannounced just to say hello. Of course, everyone wanted to hang out with my daughters, who were enjoying the attention, and friends and family asked me quiet questions about the divorce and how I was coping. By dinner time, the distant relatives had mostly dispersed, and after dinner we exchanged gifts. The grandchildren, as they do every year in my family, did well. My siblings and I exchanged gifts and laid out a pile of carefully wrapped and shipped presents in front of my parents. They said, as usual, Oh, you shouldn't have. This is too much. I don't know where to begin. When it was over, they said, You really went overboard this year. They probably would have said the same thing if we had only gotten them a bag of socks. My parents are the same way. In the early evening, it was finally time to meet my in-laws. This was something I wasn't looking forward to, despite the words of encouragement I received from family members. I suppose by this time I had a mountain of regrets built up, but not about leaving, but about how I left. 
disappearing like that with no explanation, and then dropping a couple of nasty pictures on everyone to explain my decision was not the way to go about it. I owed more to these people, and it was time to make things right. The three of us walked up to the house, and no sooner had I rung the bell than the door opened. My father-in-law was a good man, and no one in his family doubted his love, but he couldn't be called demonstrative with the men in the family. After hugging his granddaughters, he walked around them both and hugged me. It was the first time since we had met that he had done something like that. In a quiet voice, almost too quiet to be heard, he said, We're sorry, A.B. We thought we raised her better than that. Please forgive us. With that one gesture, a terrible weight was lifted off my shoulders. I'm sorry too, Jim. I should have explained things to you myself. I shouldn't have just taken off like that. Believe me, A.B., no one blames you. Karen hasn't been forthright with us, but we know what's up. My soon-to-be ex-father-in-law escorted us into the house where my mother-in-law hugged each of us and burst into tears. She was both happy to see us and saddened by the circumstances. I had always liked Anne and admired her. She gave her whole heart to her family and was vulnerable as a result. I kissed her on the cheek and thanked her for the invitation. Of course, A.B., you are still family and always will be. She buried her face in my chest for a moment, and I felt her shudder, crying quietly. All I could do was hug her and assure her that I would love her and her husband forever for all the love and support they had given me. I was stunned. I was divorcing their daughter, and all they responded to was that they loved me. From that point on, everyone welcomed me as family, kissed my daughters, and did everything they could to make me feel welcome. Karen seemed to step back as her family hugged me. I guess things weren't going exactly as she had planned. We spent several hours talking about our lives. The girls told everyone about college and I told everyone about Maine. Nothing was said about why I was now living up north, and it seemed like Karen was getting more and more worried as her family took in the stories about my new life. Everyone had already eaten, but I was offered a beer and a plate of leftovers. I gladly accepted the beer and handed over the plate. The girls received gifts from their grandparents, and they loved everything they received. The grandparents raved about them, like they were long-lost relatives who had finally come home. I kept laughing to myself and thinking, they've only been in school. I had a gift for both Jim and Anne. I felt I owed them a debt of gratitude, and they in turn gave me the heaviest sweater I had ever seen. We thought you might need it up north. Up north? I could walk to the Arctic Pole in it and not freeze, but I thanked them profusely. As I left, I took a moment to hug Karen and remind her that I'd see her in the morning. It wasn't so much a promise of more as a gesture meant to heal a grudge. At that moment, I couldn't understand her, and I didn't know what she was thinking. In the evening, I returned to my parents' house and we discussed what had happened. I told you they don't hold you responsible, A.B. They've got it all figured out. I know. Still, I expected them to try to convince me to bring her back. But they never did. We spent the evening talking and over a glass or two of sherry. My mother doesn't like hard alcohol, but a glass of sherry on a cold night seems to make everything right. Christmas morning found me at my old house opening presents with Karen and my girls. It was Christmas and we were still a family, at least for a while. We had been a family for 25 years, and old habits are ineradicable. I bought various gifts for my daughters, and then gave Karen and the girls each a pair of matching opal earrings. I thought perhaps we should celebrate the family bond at Christmas this year, and the girls liked the idea of getting earrings like their mothers. We had breakfast, and after the allotted time, the girls left for their friends, and I was left alone with Karen. We settled down in the living room, and she began her story. You know, I never meant for this to happen, A.B. I just got caught up in the excitement about the seminar and being back in college. You planned this months in advance, Karen. I overheard your conversations with Frank. You even sent me to Canada to get out of the way. At this, she got angry. Those tickets cost me a lot of money, A.B., and you just gave them away. It was a bribe, Karen. A distraction so I wouldn't find out what you were up to. I still can't believe you hired a private investigator. I would have told you if you'd only asked. There were never any secrets between us, A.B. What nonsense! I told you I knew what your plans were and begged you not to do anything that would ruin our marriage. You denied everything and lied to my face. You're putting too much importance on that, A.B. After 25 years, I deserve some time to myself. And if you'd stayed yourself, we wouldn't be divorced right now. You stayed with Frank, slept with him, and had fun with him night after night. That was only six weeks after 25 years. 
Why can't you get over it? It doesn't have to be the end of us. I'm sorry, Karen, but it is. Maybe I'm selfish. Or maybe you and Frank are just more worldly educated than I am. But I don't share. Those vows we made meant a lot to me. But when I saw you cheating, I just didn't have anything to hold on to. It's your little male ego. I've always been there for you. I've never left your side. You just can't accept that I want a little more. Maybe. I don't know if my ego is small, but I know my self-esteem is big enough to deserve more than a part-time wife from my marriage. If you come back, I'm done with Frank. Tell me something, Karen. If we go upstairs now, will I find his clothes in my closet? No. Was it hanging there last week? She didn't answer. Karen, I know Frank moved in with you after I left. I think you're hedging your bet. Maybe you'll be done with Frank if I come home, maybe not. But you'll keep Frank on a leash while I'm not here. That's true, isn't it, Karen? He's only here because you've gone away. You're out there living the bachelor life. Do you think I should be living like a nun? Actually, Karen, I live like a faithful married man away from home. There are no other women. I don't go on dates. I'm just trying to build a new life in a new place with new friends. I work hard and sometimes have a beer or dinner with co-workers. That's my life. And I've gotten back into sailing. Remember how I got into sailing before the girls came along? Well, I started working on the boat before it got really cold. We did Wednesday night races and weekend regattas, and we were doing pretty well. I've started looking at getting my own boat and I'm enjoying it. I'm trying to talk to you about our marriage, and you're talking about boats. You've always been a selfish bastard. I sat there for a minute, looking at her and waiting. No apology followed. Karen never took anything back, ever, and this time was no exception. Okay, Karen, I think it's time for me to leave. I'm flying home tomorrow. I have my new life in Maine and you have Frank. I hope you realize this was a good deal. I really hope so. With those words, I took my coat and walked out of the house that was mine. That had been ours for so many years. It was the house where we had built our marriage and raised our girls, but it was no longer my home. I would come back here for family holidays, but I would always be a guest, and for the first time, I was at peace with my decision. I was truly ready to move on. I spent the rest of the day with my parents, saw the girls when they stopped by to show off their new earrings to their grandparents, and flew home the next day. Sitting in my chair, I went over the events of the last few days in my mind, thought about how proud I was of my daughters, and offered a prayer of thanks that Karen's family seemed to understand my decision. If I fought with them, it would only make my daughter's lives more difficult. My only problem was finalizing the divorce, and then I could socialize with Karen on the rare occasions I got to see her again. I had left Rally five months before, intending to become a ghost, to disappear and stay out of sight. But I was returning to Maine a whole person again, with a family, daughters, and a life that had great potential. The pain was gone, and Karen's betrayal no longer defined me. I was ready to live again. In the years that followed, I told friends and family, I couldn't help it. I just fell in love with her. So many years have passed, and she still laughs at that corny joke. We landed in Portland, and I was standing at the baggage carousel impatiently waiting for my suitcase when it finally appeared. I quickly grabbed the handle and ran to my car. All I wanted to do was get home and put this whole trip behind me. I turned around, took a half step, tripped over both feet, and fell face first to the ground. I have to tell you, a fall like that when you're a student can be brushed off, but when you're a little over 50, it's a different matter. After gathering my courage and dealing with my embarrassment, I rolled onto my back, propped myself up on my elbows, and tried to catch my breath. I was in pain and a little disoriented. Then this cute face with brown hair and a few streaks of gray leaned over to me and asked, Are you okay? Yeah, I think I'm fine. In fact, I suddenly felt much better than okay. Who was that angel with the concerned look on her face? I didn't realize it right away, but she knelt down beside me, put her hand on my chest, and spoke to me in the most soothing voice, even though it was clear to anyone that she was, at least for a moment, worried. I'm so sorry. It was all my fault. Did you hurt yourself? After asking this, she placed her other hand on my forehead and then ran it over my head. Is there any man in the world who doesn't react to a woman making such a fuss over him? She knelt down on that dirty floor, and the only thing she cared about was making sure I was okay. I thanked her, assured her I'd be fine, paused for a moment to gaze into her face, and then smiling, began to pick my feet up under me, 
trying to stand up. Are you sure? Maybe you should just lie here for a minute. I thought about it, but I was getting better by the second. I couldn't take my eyes off of her. As I got to my feet and brushed my pants off, I realized that the reason I had fallen was because, in my hurry to get home, I had tripped over her roller bag. Like I said, I couldn't help myself. I just fell in love with it. She apologized, and by this time I was giggling. I'll be fine. It's my fault for not watching where I was going. Oh, I'm so embarrassed about this. Is there anything I can do to help? Be honest. When a beautiful woman says something like that, what are you going to do? I paused, weighed my options, and said, Well, if you have a few minutes, you might agree to have a cup of coffee with me. There's a coffee shop over there, and I probably shouldn't be driving so soon after my fall. Okay. I went a little overboard, but she smiled when I said that. I guess a cup of coffee wouldn't hurt. Mrs. Baker didn't raise fools, so I smiled and made a gesture as if to say, You lead, and I'll follow. I wish I had been as nimble, but I actually had to run my fingers through my hair first, gather my bag, then my briefcase, and take off my jacket. But I was as quick as I could be and soon followed her to her table. As she stepped back, she looked back at me as I tried to gather my thoughts, and I saw a brief smile with a hint of the shy embarrassment I'd hoped to see again. The airport coffee shop didn't have service, so I asked how she was feeling, walked over to the order here sign, and soon brought her the fanciest coffee in a paper cup that only $5 could buy. Her name was Kate, and still is. At that first coffee shop table, we got to talking about what made us arrive on the same plane. She was vacationing with her daughter Rose, who had moved south about three years ago with her husband Gabe, who had gotten a good job in my old home state, and of course I told her a brief and very streamlined version of my recent departure and return for the vacations. Oh, A.B., that's awful. I wish I could say I don't understand, but I understand it all perfectly. My husband has been a terrible cheater. I caught him at least three times during our marriage. Why did you stay with him? I stayed because of the children. They were little, and they needed a father, no matter what kind of father he was. I stayed until the youngest went off to college, and then I divorced him. It's hard to break those bonds, isn't it? Even after betrayal and pain, it's hard to leave. It was the hardest thing I ever did. But I knew he'd never stop. He couldn't. I don't know what was wrong with him. But eventually I realized that his cheating wasn't because of me. There is something missing in him, and he needs to chase women to find it. For him, it's like eating peanuts. He gets what he needs, and then eventually he needs another peanut. He'll do it until the day he dies. There was sadness in her eyes. I was drawn to those brown eyes. There were noticeable crow's feet in them, a sure sign of a mind trained by books and a heart tainted by sadness. Her skin had several fine, dense wrinkles that appear after decades of exposure to sun, wind, and snow. There was no mistaking that this woman had lived her life outdoors in Maine. Sometimes I feel like I've been both mother and father to my children. For over two decades, I was a wife and mother, but my husband would go AWOL even when he was around, so I did a lot of things on my own. I took my kids camping, taught them how to swim and ski. I think those lessons will stay with them, and I get a certain joy out of it. You can't spend all your time playing computer games. Don't I know it? I tried raising my two girls outdoors, but my wife was never thrilled about it. I even sold my sailboat when the girls were little because I had to choose where to spend my time, on the water or with them. Shame on you, A.B. Kate grinned. You let your wife get away with too much. I had to admit, her scolding hurt a little. But she had a point. I think I've gotten a second chance with the girls. I see them more often now than when I lived in North Carolina, and I've started looking for a boat. I might be able to help you with that. I know the yachting community here, and I've heard of some nice boats for sale. I might be able to help you find something. Do you know what you want? Well, when I was young, I used to race. But that kind of thing doubles or triples the cost of sailing. I'm thinking of something 30 feet long with enough freeboard so the waves hit the sides instead of the deck. I want to sail it out of Casco Bay so it needs to handle the offshore swell without making the crew wet. I want it dry enough so I don't have to put on protective gear just because the wind has picked up, but I don't want it to be bad. You know what I mean? Are you planning on doing any overnight stays? Sure, a few, but I don't need any standing room at the bottom. I don't need all that wind interference from the high cabins. I like to be able to see where I'm going and dodge those lobster pots. That made her laugh a little. 
I want a boat that handles well and is reasonably responsive, but nothing crazy. Sounds like you're still into racing. Well, maybe a little. I smiled. I hear there are classic yacht races here? Here? Yes, Southern boy, we have classic yacht races here. She laughed again. It's a good sign when you can make a beautiful woman laugh. We talked for far longer than anyone would want to spend in an airport cafe, and I took every advantage I could to appear attentive, taking in her face, her smile, and that little bashful look when she caught me looking at her for too long. Eventually, I realized it was time. I suppose you have to go, but is there any chance we'll see each other again? I think it's possible. What do you mean? I've been gone for almost a week, so I don't know what's going on this weekend. How about dinner and maybe a movie? She only smiled, pulled a piece of paper out of her purse, and wrote down her address and phone number. Call me Friday night, and we can plan everything. Yes, Mom. I'm new here, so if you have a favorite place, be sure to tell me. She was smiling genuinely now. I can, or I can just see what you come up with. It was already late Wednesday, so I had a few days to come up with something good. Back at the apartment, I looked up my favorite establishments and got lucky. One Longfellow Square had a concert scheduled for Saturday night by one of my favorite folk musicians. I quickly called them and bought the last two tickets. Now all I needed was somewhere to eat dinner. I made a reservation at a nice seafood place, not too pretentious, but with a nice atmosphere, and left the Italian place on reserve in case she didn't like seafood. Then I went out and bought a new shirt, a pair of pants that didn't have creases in them yet, and a jacket that hadn't been fashionable in the past decade. That's how it all started. Over dinner that Saturday night, she told me what she'd learned about the ways of a cheating husband, and I filled in the blanks I'd left in my own story. For a while, our dinner was in danger of being consumed by grief and anger, until I said, We can't do this. What do you mean? I mean that we can't let them poison our evening. What do you say we let the ghosts haunt someone else for the rest of the evening? She smiled. Deal. So tell me about your daughters. Well, that's all a proud father needs. I told her about my daughters, all their friends, and how they come to visit at least one weekend every month. She made me promise to take her out to breakfast the next time they came to visit, and you can bet I wasn't going to forget that request. She then told me about her daughter and son. I didn't immediately realize that we both have children who are just as wonderful, and we can be proud that we raised them right. The music that evening was delightful, warm, and intimate. You don't go to a folk concert unless you're ready to sing along to a few songs, and that night we both mustered up the courage to try to sing along. I failed, she laughed, and I sang again. Her laughter made me feel invincible. When I drove her home, she invited me out for coffee. Coffee was a code word for coffee. We sat and talked, drinking coffee and talking some more. When the conversation died down and I thought it was time for me to leave, I said, Kate, I'd really like to see you again. Is that possible? Yes, A.B., very possible. She smiled and paused to stare intently into her mug. But I need to say something. I can't. Don't want to get involved with a married man. I understand. My divorce is due to be finalized in March, and I'm not going to change my mind about it. How about we limit it to friendship for now? I love being with you, A.B., but I don't want to feel guilty looking in the mirror. Believe me, I understand. I think I'd be more comfortable that way, too. Now it was my time to stare intently into my mug. But I have to be honest with you, Kate. I'd like to see my new friend more often, if she's willing. She was smiling broadly now. I think she's more than willing. I received a very chaste kiss on the cheek as I left her that evening. I got another when I picked her up for dinner the following Wednesday night, and another when I drove her home. For a guy who had been married for a very long time, I was living large. Our life continued in this way for ten weeks. We started seeing each other twice a week, then moved to three times, and on our free evenings we often called each other on the phone. On weekends, when weather permitted, she would direct me to explore Maine taking back roads to small towns both on the coast and inland. She had a knack for finding quaint stores in small towns off the roads, and we explored them as part of our adventure. She showed me marinas, stores of aging hippie artisans, and small out-of-the-way restaurants. When we didn't go anywhere, we cooked together. I was having a great time, though I admit a quiet voice in the back of my mind was saying, Be careful about romances on the margins. Take your time. Look before you leap. I hate that voice. She met my daughters when they came to visit, and they started asking if Kate would be with them the next time they came to visit. 
I remember saying, You don't like Kate? What's the problem? We love Kate. If she can't make it, we can come another weekend. At that, I calmed down. At the same time, I met her son and daughter. There was no doubt that they were cut from the same cloth as my own daughters, and when we introduced the four of them plus one husband, we were forever outnumbered. Kate told me that she had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with her children about us just being friends. She said they didn't buy it, and as the weeks went by, neither did I. I talked to my girls about the same thing, and they just smirked. I'm being serious. Kate and I agreed that as long as I was married to your mother, we would play by the rules. I won't do anything to break my vows, at least not until they're dissolved. We know, Dad. And if Mom hadn't been foolish, you'd still be a faithful husband, but she did. You deserve to be happy, Daddy, and Kate will make you happy. Besides, we like her. Yeah, Mom doesn't like her, but we do. What does your mom know about Kate? They looked at each other confused. I'm sorry, Dad. Don't be mad, but we kind of told her about Kate. You'd think I was relieved to hear that. But that wasn't the case. The months I'd spent from August until Christmas, and then the week since I'd met Kate, had taken their toll on me. I had come to terms with Karen's betrayal and moved on, and I was happy. Seven months ago, I would have celebrated Karen's misery and fueled her jealousy. I would have rubbed her nose in it, but I wasn't like that now. There was no point in pouring salt on her wounds. Her life was her punishment. Kate and I continued to explore our developing friendship. We spent many evenings together, but at night we slept alone in our own beds. One evening in late March, my life changed again when I came home from work and read the mail. In a manila envelope from my attorney's office was the final judgment of my divorce from Karen. I had seen the end of my marriage with my own eyes when I viewed the videotape taken in Illinois in late June. I now had legal confirmation of my freedom. No matter how much I thought I was ready for it, no matter how hard I worked for it, when it happens, the realization hits you hard. 25 years of marriage and a life devoted to one woman doesn't make it easy to prepare for starting over. I sat on the couch for probably an hour or more, reflecting on the past, and when I was ready, I called Kate. Do you need some company? I can come over. I think I need to be alone tonight. I think I need to grieve for a while. Does that make sense? That makes sense. I'll let you hang out. Call me when you're ready, and if I don't hear from you in a few days, I'll call your landlord to fumigate the apartment. God help me. This woman makes me smile. I don't think it will come to that. Okay, A.B., don't forget me. How can I forget you? It was just one night. I sat around, felt sorry for myself, drank a few beers, and went to bed. In the morning, I felt significantly better. I called my daughters, told them the news, and then called Kate and asked if she would go to dinner with me. You're in luck. I'm free tonight. How about tomorrow night? That was my attempt at flirting. After 25 years of marriage, a man loses his flirting skills and risks appearing desperate. You're lucky again. I happen to be free both nights. Well, how about we have dinner tonight and a drink overlooking the bay, and then we'll decide what to do tomorrow. We had a lovely evening. As I walked Kate to her door, hoping for our usual, albeit chaste, kiss on the cheek, I started to say goodnight. I saw tears in her eyes. I said I wouldn't get involved with a married man. I never said anything about a divorced man. After another kiss, she said, And now we officially leave the friendship phase and start the dating phase, if that's okay with you. With those words, she ran her hand over my cheek, turned around and walked into her house. She smiled one last time and closed the door. I froze for a moment, trying to comprehend what had just happened. I thought I had the green light, and then it was gone. After a moment of fleeting frustration, I reminded myself that Kate is a serious woman. She's not going to jump into bed with me on her first free day. The friendship had been solid, and now the courtship was beginning. Realizing this, I left her porch a happy man and smiled all the way home. The next evening, it was exactly the same. After that, I was invited back into the house. Now, however, whenever we were together, whether it was a walk around town or cooking together, there was a completely different atmosphere in the house. There was an electricity in the air that was always present, but always suppressed. Now it was no longer suppressed. There were token smiles, loving tones, and gentle touches. No matter how we spent the evening, it ended on the couch with conversation. Of course, I had known for three months that I had a girlfriend. My daughters knew. Her kids knew. My friends at work knew. Hell, even my parents and ex-wife knew. But now she was showing me. 
We grew closer each day as we continued to eat dinner, travel the countryside, and find whatever adventures we could. It was early May, and spring was in the air. Daffodils were blooming and lupines were blooming. The days were warm and the nights were cool. Perfect sleeping weather. Kate called me at work around noon on Friday and asked if I wanted to come over for dinner that night. Of course, I said yes. Then she practically knocked me off my chair by saying, Pack a small bag. I'm going to make breakfast and then we can look at the boat I found for you. She said it so mundanely that I admittedly almost let it pass my ears. When I realized what she had said, I was at a loss for a moment. Uh, bag? <laughs> yes, unless you want to wear your work clothes to the yard. I left work early and rushed to my house to take a shower. Then I showered again. I packed some clothes but put them in my satchel. I didn't want to seem like some weirdo who took a suitcase to his girlfriend's house. So I packed for three days. I was ready to stay until Monday morning. Hell, I'd take a day off work and spend the whole week here if I could talk her into it. I pulled up to her house and got in the car. My pulse was racing and my mouth was dry. Don't think about it too much. Calm down. Calm yourself down. Don't be embarrassed. You've both been working on this since Christmas. Just relax and it'll work out. I worried alternately between being too nervous to stand up and ejaculating as I crossed the threshold of her bedroom. Twenty-five years of marriage, and again it felt like the first time. Then I thought, maybe I'm sleeping in the guest room. She didn't say. Okay, I can do that. Don't expect too much. Everything takes time. That thought brought me both relief and disappointment at the same time. I thought about leaving my backpack in the car in case I was misunderstood, but screw it. She met me at the door. I set my backpack down, and for a moment, I thought I saw a flicker of confusion or disappointment on her face. You said to pack a bag. I just thought... Kate smiled. I seemed to amuse her easily. I hope they didn't get wrinkled. Taking my hand, Kate led me into the kitchen. I was thinking lasagna and a salad on the side. Does that sound good? Everything sounds good. So we got into a routine we'd been building for months. We cooked together and drank wine while the lasagna baked. We ate and talked and she flirted with me in a way she'd never flirted with me before. I was on cloud nine. I didn't eat much that night. My stomach was too nervous for food. We had suppressed our desires for so many months that now I wasn't sure of her intentions. Could this really be the night? I was helping clear the table when I noticed her hands were shaking. Kate, are you okay? You're shaking like a leaf. She laughed softly and looked at the floor, shaking her head. A.B., I've only had one man in my life. I'm nervous. And I thought I was the only one nervous today. Now we were laughing together. Did I misunderstand the invitation? No, A.B., I'm ready now. With those words, she took my hand and led me to her bedroom. After all the days and evenings I had spent at her house, this was the first time I had been in her bedroom. It was beautiful, warm and inviting, just like Kate's. As soon as we crossed the threshold of her bedroom, we got down to it. In the morning, I woke up to the smell of bacon and coffee. I made my way to the kitchen, and there waiting for me was Kate's son, Bobby, taking a bite of bacon and sipping his first cup of coffee. Sleep well, A.B.? The smile on his face couldn't be mistaken for a smile when he caught us. Well, that was awkward. Ah, uh, yes, very well. Thank you. Kate started laughing at my discomfort. Relax, A.B., I already told the nosy one that you spent the night. So, what are your intentions for my mother? Smart ass. He grinned from one ear to the other. Well, since you asked, I intend to get some bacon and coffee and then take your mother to bed. Sit down and eat. You'll need your strength for later. Bobby almost choked on his bacon. He knew exactly what mom and I were up to, but such candor from mom took him by surprise. We had a breakfast of scrambled eggs and bacon, locally made salsa, toast with jam, and washed it all down with good dark coffee. Apparently, Bobby decided he'd had enough of me because breakfast was a nice, family-like atmosphere. I guess after all these months and time together, it really was the beginning of a new family. It felt good, and I wouldn't trade that feeling for anything. Sometime later, after a few more strips of bacon and a few more cups of Kate's excellent coffee, Bobby announced that it was time for him to leave. I walked him to the door, and for the first time since I'd known him, I reached out my hand, which he took, and gave me a hug. Welcome to the family, A.B. I know Mom is in good hands now. I hated to admit it, 
but tears came to my eyes as I watched Bobby walk to his car. Are you two doing okay? I turned around and saw Kate standing behind me, smiling. Yes, we're doing fine. From that morning on, Kate and I rarely slept apart. And if we did, it was usually because one of us was working late or traveling. Bobby seemed to make no effort to keep our secret, and soon my daughter started calling and asking leading questions like, if I need to talk to you tonight, where will you be? The first time I heard this, I didn't understand and panicked. What do you mean? Is everything okay? Is something wrong? This phrase became a constant refrain for both of my daughters. Since that first night, my life has only gotten bigger and more fulfilling. My girls started visiting more often and bringing their friends with them. They decided to spend another summer working in labs on campus, but spent more and more time in Maine. Kate's daughter brought her family up north for summer vacation. We have both a house and an apartment, and weekends when all the kids were in town required logistics that only women could organize. Bobby seemed to see my daughters as his sisters and their friends as his. He began to look forward to their visits almost as much as I did. By the end of the summer, I knew what I wanted to do. There is a cute little jewelry store in downtown Portland that has been there forever. The store isn't part of a national chain, and he makes beautiful, one-of-a-kind jewelry, so I paid him a visit. It just so happened that he was nearing retirement, and his daughter took over the business, so she was especially helpful in helping me design the ring. A center ring with a flawless stone and smaller stones on either side of it on a slightly flattened band on top. It was the last weekend of summer, and the whole family was in town. The mood was elevated, and we decided to have a barbecue on the back patio. Steaks were grilled, salads were prepared, and beer and wine poured in rivers. When everyone had finished their meal and conversation resumed, I called everyone to attention. If you will pay attention to me for a moment, everyone here knows my story. A year ago, I was running from my problems. I ended up here with only my girls in the fall, and if I had lived the rest of my life with only these two jewels, I would have died a happy man. But things didn't turn out the way I expected. For the first time in my life, my clumsy nature has worked in my favor. This brought laughter from around the table. I met someone who changed my life. She made me smile again, she made me live again, and she doubled my family. I saw smiles all around the table. I've long thought that I must be the luckiest person in the world, and now I feel like I need to do something about it. With those words, I dropped to one knee. She gasped. What are you doing? Kate was shaking like a leaf. I'm doing something I've wanted to do for a long time. Kate, you gave me my life back and made it better than it ever was. I know this is the life I want today, tomorrow, and forever. I'm asking you to be my wife. The girls held their breath and the men stared at their mother. Yes, A.B., I will marry you. And with those words came cheers of approval, hugs, and I was a grinning fool. There were toasts and congratulations. Bobby asked if his mom was pregnant, and all the girls rolled their eyes. Soon the women retired to the living room to make wedding plans, and Bobby, Gabe, and I were left to watch the sunset. It was the end of August. They say it takes a year to plan a wedding, but we were married in just two months. It was late October with the last of the fall colors on the trees. I think a fall wedding is quite appropriate for a couple our age, but I'm not ready to consider that we have the fall of our lives just yet. I envisioned a small wedding with family, but that didn't happen. As soon as word got out about it, the guest list took on a life of its own and grew from 20 people to over 100. Standing at the altar, I marveled at how my life had changed in just one short year. My parents, siblings, and Kate were there. I guess we must have good genes because our parents were in their 70s and still going strong. My old friends from Raleigh came too. Along with Kate's friends, my new friends from work and the sailing community came along. Even Karen's parents came to wish me well. Despite everything that happened to their daughter, they never disowned me. It was a full house and lots of love. The reception was one for the record books. The fall air was inviting and the party spilled out of the hall onto the lawn. Like magic, new kegs and bottles appeared and the band turned up the amps. Kate and I stayed until sunset and quietly left while the party was in full swing. The next morning we met for brunch with the closest family members and while Kate and I felt great, some of them looked a little underwhelmed. When I told the waitress I liked scrambled eggs, two women ran off to the restroom. I gave up my apartment and we settled into Kate's house, but it was short-lived. We soon decided that while Kate had many happy memories with this house, it also had too many bad memories of her first marriage. We set out to find a house to call our own, 
and settled on a three-bedroom cottage, finished in shingle, with a large porch that could accommodate the whole family. Property on the water was too expensive for us to consider, but a home in a North Bay Shore community two blocks from the water and overlooking the harbor was something we could afford. By spring, we had upgraded the kitchen and heating system, and I was looking forward to a summer where my fiancé and I could leave work early, ride the boat before dinner, and watch the last boats pull away to their docks at sunset. It was then that I began to realize that my fiancé would forever surprise me. No. Your parents are coming to visit on the 4th of July. Sounds like fun. They came for the holiday and stayed for three weeks. The girls would come every weekend with their usual group of friends, and daughter Kate and her family would spend the holiday week too. It was crazy, but we managed. The couples took over the bedrooms, and the young people took over the sofas and sleeping bags. It was a wonderful vacation, and like every time, I missed them when they left. It is now five years after the wedding, and I could never have imagined my life today. My friends from Raleigh come to visit every summer. Between friends and family, we rarely have an empty bedroom. My parents decided to become snowbirds. They spend summers with us in Maine and winters in Raleigh. Dad, who was in the Navy decades ago, took up sailing as if he was born to do it, and now we sail all summer on Casco Bay and the waters off the coast of Maine. Mom and Kate join us when they're not exploring antique stores and used bookstores along the coast. Kate's parents have grown close to mine, and now they're spending the worst of the Maine winter in North Carolina. Rose and Gabe had a second child, a son. When his company didn't want to transfer him back to Maine, he left them and found a new position here. After a few quick promotions, his business was doing better than if he had stayed in North Carolina. Ben turned out to be a keeper, and a year after he and Claire graduated, he asked my permission to marry my daughter. I readily approved her choice, and they were married in June. Their first child was due in two months. Denise has graduated and found a good job in Portland. She brings her young man with her when she comes to visit, and I suspect we will continue to see him. Bobby still plays the field, but Kate is sure that when the right girl comes along, he will fall hopelessly under her influence. Kate, always surprising me, announced two summers ago that my former in-laws were coming to visit for the week of the 4th of July. I didn't expect this turn of events, but Kate believes in building bridges, and they've always treated me with love. It turned out to be a delightful week. My parents are here, Kate's parents came over, and the kids were in the house as often as they could be. I thought all of this was already as weird as can be, but Kate had another surprise in store for me. Have you seen it happen? No. Not in my wildest fantasies or worst nightmares did I expect this. In late July, she quietly and calmly sat me down at the table and announced that Karen would be staying with us the first weekend in August. What? Your ex-wife is coming for the weekend? I know how you feel about her, but it's time to bury the hatchet for good. Your daughters need to know that their parents can get along, and she feels abandoned when the girls live here. And whose fault is that? I know, but it's time. She can't hurt you anymore. Hey. I'll admit there was a dark cloud hanging over our house for a few days after that, but eventually I got over it. It was just a weekend, right? I guess Karen was still lonely. I always knew Frank wasn't a keeper, and she realized it when he moved on to younger pastures. During the visit, she avoided any mention of Frank or our divorce, except to offer me her only sincere apology. After all, we were getting along well enough that I saw brief glimpses of the girl I had once loved and married. Although Kate had set out to establish some sort of friendship with Karen, I couldn't help but notice that she was unusually loud that night when we went to bed. Always demonstrative, Kate was usually quiet enough to keep our relationship a secret. That night, she made sure Karen heard. And here I am living 600 miles from where I thought I would spend my life. My plans to become a ghost and disappear have failed miserably. I have a new life, a new wife, a family twice the size I imagined, with grandchildren and friends who enrich my life every day. I have love all around me, and it doesn't get any better than that. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.